never lack, cause I'm blam it up. You ain't from around here, we finna jam you up. Cali swag game lace, where the cameras. Cross the shoulder, stay bridge with a froze wrist. Head four away, turned up the yoga bitch. Thanks for with everybody, man. I hope everybody's having a productive day, feeling blessed. And like I always say, it's one life, one chance. When we got one chance to do this right, so let's get it done. Well, the holidays are coming soon, so I hope everybody has a blessful holidays. I hope you guys get to spend time with your guys' family. I hope you get everything you want for Christmas, that little wish list you had all year long. You know, I hope, you know, through the hands of God, you know, and the blessings and hard work and dedication, you guys receive everything for you and your guys' family and you provide for your guys' kids and, you know, have a wonderful, have wonderful holidays this year. With that being said, hit the subscription, hit the like, leave a comment, tell me what you guys think about this next story. Because I find it to be one of my most intriguing stories. It won't be that much about violence, but it seemed to be just something in particular that I went through that I thought was pretty amazing that I was actually glad I was exposed to. I want to talk about an individual named Fo, who was an ex Southerner from Sacramento, who was doing life without the possibility of parole, who was actually a Northern Rider slash writer, and one of Snoop's biggest disciples before Snoop allowed him to get hurt. Fo was there in the movement within for 15 years at Snoop's side. Fo was pretty much identified throughout the whole movement as Snoop's right-hand man. That was one of his biggest disciples that, that, that we've all known. The thing is, Fo knew his place. But what I want to shed light to is uh, obviously you guys heard X-rated interviews on the all over these other podcasts, these big mainstream podcasts. Then you've heard a lot of people call in and say their versions of the X-rated story that were involved in it. I've listened to all three versions of the X-rated situation. From Foe's mouth, Rowdy's mouth, Cisco's mouth, Johnny Boy's mouth. And then I hear X-rated's version. I'm telling you right now, I can honestly tell you guys right now, they're all different. I, wouldn't, I don't really care to elaborate too much on how the stories differentiate from person to person. But all of them have their own versions of what took place. But Foe, Mike, and Amigo was a part of that. Sad to say, this particular incident, the X-rated incident, you know, I highlighted the Northern Rider movement on the SNY side and then on YouTube, you know, you know, publicly, the publicity, you know, helped out the movement. A lot of people started gravitating towards it. But I hate to say the fact that this is the only thing that sheds light to our movement is beauty. But still, the individuals involved in this particular case, they all used to always walking around like, you know, they were they were knights in shining armor. They were like heroic people because they got rid of a high profile individual. A lot of us that were part of this movement at the time, we used to be like, bro, so what, bro? Dead issue. Past. Just focus on the present. That don't make you guys better than us. But Foe always felt like he was better than everybody because he had Snoop's ear. That was one individual Snoop would always listen to and... and and tune in if, if folks spoke up on some irregularities, some mishaps, some unfortunate circumstances, you know, some type of prison form on behalf of the movement, that kind of thing. But I want to bring something up that I thought was interesting. After the whole Scrappy situation and when Scrappy branched off and started going against Snoop, after we got off lockdown, after we stopped going to war with the two fibers, I ended up in the cell with Crow from West Side Merced. 209 area, one of gun, one of, another one of Gunner's good homies. And this individual Crow, man, he's, he was on a different level of education. But he was selled up with Foe around when I showed up and Foe got transferred to D Yard when I landed on C Yard. So Crow and Foe were in, in contact and communication with one another on a consistent basis, I mean weekly basis, about issues regarding the movement. Snoop was in the Kern Valley uh, ad seg, getting transferred to Tehachapi at the time. This is when, this is in 2014 when Snoop started getting arrogant after he dropped the end. He realized that he gained a lot of control back on his movement. He went to Tehachapi and became a totally different, tyrannical president, in which I've said a lot before. But one thing Fo introduced, one thing I thought was one of the most incredible, innovating creativities I've ever seen was this man had his sister get a loan from a bank to start a book publishing company. His idea was like, bro, we're gonna, we gotta stop fighting on the yard for drugs. We gotta stop fighting one another because we have nothing else to do. We gotta stop fighting one another and brutalizing one another because 
Snoop's making things stricter and stricter and stricter and giving us no leeway to maneuver and do what we want, only unless it's under his command and his jurisdiction of what he wants done. To others, to, to, to the movement, you know, he was restricting our, our, our free will. Now, Fo gets the book, book, book publishing company up and running. And he started off just with a typewriter in the cell typing up urban books. And if you look at his catalog at, you know, the cellblock.net, some of those books I had a hand in helping and writing. But what he wanted to do is he looked at the compas and said, you know, let's become published authors. Let's publish our own urban books and make some money so we could take care of ourselves. No more of this drug trade, no more of this drug finances, no more running up debts and getting high and doing nothing when our time is in the cell. One of the first thing he did is he approached me, Choco, and like four other artists. It was like, you guys do all do a, like two drawings each. I put them together and create an uh, a inmate calendar with our artwork and sell it online. And we did it. Then it went from, hey, let's, let's create a, a resource directory for prisoners. That way in, in, inmates can have you know, resources to, to reference and utilize whenever possible. So we'd all come together and we were like, you know what, we kind of, we started believing into this movement, a different form of movement. Like, man, we got something better to work forward, better to work for and work towards as opposed to just going to the yard and wanting to find reasons to fight a two five or ourselves. He wanted homeboys to tell their whole true life stories, you know, memoirs, and you know, get these books published. That's how Loyal Team Betrayal came about, which was an ex MA associate that turned into a two fiver who used to work for Mike Lerner, you know, the Mexican mafia member. It's called Loyal Team Betrayal. You see it on the cover, on the thumbnail. The ones that took it serious the most were me and Crow and Foe. Everybody else looked at it like, you know, they don't want no part of it. They were better than that. It was a waste of time. They're going to go do their own thing. So we took it upon ourselves and said, you know what? Let's create something for ourselves. So we did. I helped Mike and Amigo. Me and Crow did help him create that resource directly. That's probably one of his biggest selling books in prison. And he made thousands of dollars off that book alone. Then we came up with the idea, Kitty Cat, buying all these pictures off the tier for a dollar, creating one big book out of it, a bunch of women in thongs and lingerie, created the book called Kitty Cat. That made thousands of dollars. And, you know, Fold looked out for us. Fold looked out for me and Crow. We'd get our, you know, every quarter we'd get our issue of money, you know, that were blessings or more likely get a package sent to us. You know, Foe was well taken care of. His family looked out for him. Then he started creating a lot of urban books. He was reading a lot of, well, what he was doing, he was reading a lot of urban books, you know, big popular urban books, rewriting the stories a little bit, switching up the characters, creating the fictional story, and selling them. And people on the tier were buying these books to read. Crow from Westside Merced actually published his own book called, his own book called This Is My Life. And it was all his poems and uh, what happened in his, uh, his case. He actually caught a, a he actually caught a, he actually caught a, a murder case on the streets, killing a southerner at a high school, stabbed him in the chest in a locker room. And Gunners Collective could tell you about all that. You know, this dude's well known in the city of Merced. Very good homie. Crow publishes a book. Me and, me and Mike and Amigo created letter writing to prisoners, showing individuals how to write pen pal letters, and we drafted up a list full of free pen pal websites and free pen pal organizations that'll hook you up with like Christian women, women in general, published that book. That got a lot of notoriety in prison. Individuals wanted to read that book because they wanted pen pals. You know, we were utilizing our time wisely and productively. And he's, him and Rowdy were the two individuals that I always seen want to create some type of innovating content to help us flourish and be better than gang mentalities, be better than fighting on a yard, be better than following a tyrannical maniac. And so we did for a whole year, we wound up publishing multiple books. Obviously, you know, they're under his publishing company. It's under, it's under his name. Well, we, there was a lot of us that had a lot to do with helping out that publishing company get, on the, get off the ground and get to where it was at. This is where it gets intriguing. Now I've seen a couple other platforms, you know, publish broadly snoop's book or let him read it you know i read some of the comments people were making fun of badass snoop as, as much as problems i have against that man it's a good book but let me tell you how it came about i remember i was in a cell with crow and i told crow i was like hey if you really think about it a lot of the hell's angels 
went through it, went through all the legalities to get their patches, their colors, their logos approved and trademarked and copywritten. So it can't be used against them and through, through criminal, through the criminal law. And I told him, I go, I remember somebody telling me that the 88 precepts that the skinheads and the, the white supremacies used were constructed from a church. This is what I was told. I don't know if this is fact, but it was through a church and they got these 88 precepts approved in which all the Nazis, lowriders and the skinheads and the white Aryans, they all use, they all promoted to help organize their people, to govern their people. You know, in accordance to keeping the white, in accordance to taking care of the white race, keeping the white race pure. I haven't read these 88 concepts. It's just I talked to a lot of skinheads who told me about them, explained a little bit about them. So I got a brief understanding, not a concise understanding, just a brief understanding of what they really were. Plus, like I said, I've been reading a lot of biker gang books and I was like, you know what? You need to, we need to tell Snoop that he should, he should publish the CCOs because nothing in the CCOs indicates any level of violence, the way it's written, all it is, how we're taking care of one another, what we're living up for, what this movement is based on. So there was nothing in our CCOs that could be indicated that this is an organized crime group, that it's for the furtherance of a prison gang, nothing. So I told him, hey, we should utilize it and get it published. This is where Snoop went wrong. When we, write, when we wrote Foe, Foe said, you know what, that's a great idea, I'm going to tell Snoop. So when he told Snoop, Snoop was in Tehachapi in the shoe when Tehachapi's shoe was converting into a regular prison yard. Snoop said, okay, I'll do it. But Snoop started writing it just as the CCOs and breaking it down. And we had to reiterate like, bro, you're going to have to change some of the words instead of using riders, instead of using playboys. When they know they identify us, change the words. Like, you're going to have to dumb it down into basic fundamentals. That's exactly what we told that individual. Basic fundamentals. Just break it down small. So he changed it up a lot of the words. Instead of playboy, he used player. Instead of outlining the CCOs word for word, he gener he he generalized them in a different way, in a different fashion, when it only made sense to us. As long as you've been in this movement long enough and you knew you would know what he was talking about, what what stories and what references he was using about particular situations and why the changes were made because of these particular situations. That's why each chapter is done differently. No one on YouTube is going to understand that book unless you've been part of the movement. I, I can see how what it looks like on his other platforms as he's reading it out loud or some people got a hold of the book. Yeah, it makes no sense. Obviously, he's going to glorify himself and place himself in a higher regard of prestige, you know, he's, you know, elegant prominence, as he wants to put it, because he's the president. But I'm telling you, that book alone itself, it only means something. And you can only understand it as if you've been part of this movement. So he does. So he changes some of the words. Finally, Foe gets back at me and Crow and he tells us, hey, man, the book is done, bro. It's bad. It's going to be bad. And we're like, cool. So now Snoop got his own book. There's supposed to be a part two. But since Foe got removed, Snoop decided not to do it no more. Now, this goes to show you, you know, his ideologies isn't for the betterment of this movement. It's only what he wants or what he wants to get done. His eyes, he turned that book into something else. That's why Foe doesn't publish it no more. And it's just available on Amazon. Because Foe see the treachery when Foe got removed, that Snoop wasn't there to back him up when he should have. See, once the book got published, published, Basic Fundamentals of the Game, Snoop then issued out a policy that every Northern Rider, rider on the yards is to have a copy of this book. They need to buy it. He sanctioned it as a, as a mandate. And a lot of us didn't take it seriously. Like, no, bro, we want the book, we'll get the book. We don't need the book because we got the CCOs in the house. We don't need this book. This book was just to legalize it. So that way, when it gets taken in and it gets used against us in court, we don't have to worry about it being used in, 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 as the furtherance of, a, of an organized crime. The book was just to be published publicly so it become legalized as long as he went about it the right way, which Foe did. Copywritten everything, trademarked everything, everything that was written in there, you know, belongs to Snoop now. Foe did that, not Snoop. Snoop wasn't creative like that. Snoop just liked violence, likes alcohol, likes white lightning, likes drugs, and likes being a boss on the yard. 
That's as far as that man's ever going to go. And we all realize that. Foe was trying to take things to a next level. Foe wanted us to be businessmen. The so foe gets the book done. Then foe's the communication to all the yards because, you know, he had family and resources and a network that he can communicate with everybody. Snoop utilized foe for that matter. Foe started realizing that he Snoop, Snoop was just utilizing him for his means of resources because he was a source of interest. But Foe tells everybody, hey, bro, Snoop said everybody needs to buy a copy of this. That's because Foe and Snoop had it in the back of their heads. Like, man, if everybody buys a, a, a copy of this book and there's 2,000 members of us in the, on the SNY side, times that by 20, and we split the money in half, we're going to make a five ten thousand $10,000 profit each. They wanted to capitalize and monetize us for their behalf to pocket them. That's when homies were like, no, bro, we're not going to do that. Every you'll see that book in one compasel on the yard, but the homies didn't take heed to it. Snoop didn't like that because Snoop lost out on a lot of money. And we started reaching back to Snoop like, look, bro, we don't have to buy the book. We just got thought it was a great idea for you to do the book. You know, do a memoir of yourself. Every, somebody's gonna want to read it. You know, the outside world's gonna want to read it. We already know who you are. So don't force us to buy the book because you want us to have the book. Because he was trying to make it law, right or law, have this book in the cell or else you're going to be held accountable because ignorance is no excuse of the law. So we used to look at him like, man, hell no, we ain't buying this damn book, bro. Get the hell out of here, bro. Now, now, you, now you took it too far to where we're going to rebel against it. And I remember he used to tell a lot of homies that when he was on the yard, we're like, bro, you don't got my book, bro. You don't got my book, playboy. You, you're fucking up. That's what he would do. And he would try to force people to buy his book. But let me tell you like some... But at the end of the day, he gives credit to Foe in that book, to Rowdy, to Johnny Boy. But he only gives credit to individuals that he knew would listen to him, that were under his command, that were his disciples. He didn't credit me and Crow, they were the ones that brought up the idea. He didn't credit Foe and Crow, and Crow, Foe and Crow were the ones that said, hey, fool, let's drop the end and see what happens. He takes responsibility for himself, and that's why he's in the predicament that he's in now, never coming home. And he was supposed to come home a year ago. That's his own fault. So now, while he publishes his book, now he used to love bragging about it. I'm a published author now, Playboy. He, like, he, looked at, he looked at it like being a published author was something higher than an inmate. It's like, bro, you're just still one of us, bro. You just had uh, the means and access and resources to actually publish a book. Some people want to publish books. Scrappy was able to do it. Crow was able to do it. Foe has 20, 30 books that are all urban books. He even has a book about underworld Zillas, how the Zillas started. Now, Foe is collaborating with people in different prisons and people in the federal prisons to create these urban stories. He even got a book about Fast Eddie, the one that was an XN, the one that XN never turned new flower. You know, that man set, I want to say that man set the expectation. He set the demo. He set the bar high. Snoop never did. So when Foe got removed, Foe got removed because of popularity. Because every time, because Foe wasn't a goon, Foe, Foe wasn't a goon. Foe, Foe will tell you straight up, he wasn't a gangster. He was a businessman. He wanted to create networks and businesses for us. He didn't like to fight. He did fight. He didn't like to fight. Foe always said, hey, bro, you know your movement in this place, man. Play your role. Stay in your lane. And if you don't have nothing to offer this table, but you a goon, you like to fight, then you, really, you better be the best damn fighter you are in the yard. That way we can utilize you for that since that's all your work. He's like, I'm worth more than that to this movement. I can network. I can communicate. I can establish grounds for us. I can lead the people. I can interpret the law. So he always played this position in the background. And homie started seeing it. I was like, man, you're no better than us because you got Snoop's ear. Because Foe went like four or five years without even picking up, a, picking up a battery, picking up a fight, picking up a case. Nothing. So the homie started looking at him like, bro, you're, now you're just utilizing us. And you're the one reaping all the benefits, you and Snoop, because you guys are the ones micromanaging them and, and, and puppet mastering the whole movement from the sidelines. That's when Snoop started getting caught out on this stuff. But now the book company is up and running, but a lot of compas ain't taking it serious. Compas want to just go back to using drugs, selling drugs, and just being dolphins and fighting one another. But I took it serious. I was in the process of saying, you know what, I'll publish my own book just to have something to do, just to stay busy in the cell so I can think of something other than wanting to go out and fight my own homies. But I get transferred to Tehachapi because I do another battery on, a, on an individual from Compton. I get transferred to Hatchapi. I meet Snoop. 
spend some time on the yard with Snoop for a couple months before he gets snatched up to the hole for disrupting the program. And then I find out later on that Foe gets whacked because he kept utilizing Snoop's name, saying, well, if you guys don't do this, I'm going to tell Snoop. If you guys don't do this, I'm going to tell Snoop. You guys are going against everything that Snoop's laying down. Because Kern Valley's committee runs itself. Kern Valley's always been like that. Kern Valley does what it wants to do with or without Snoop's approval because they believe in themselves as a committee as a whole because they were well-seasoned compadres. They believed into the movement, not what Snoop said. That's why Snoop only has control of Tehachapi because he was on that yard and in that ad seg and he controlled a lot of those individuals' mentality because he embraced a lot of those in the, he embraced a lot of those individuals so they follow his lead. Like, man, if he jumped off a cliff, they're going to go right with him. So when I get to Tehachapi, I forget. I actually lose myself for a little while because he has it to where every individual is in there ready to smash for any little reason. They all wanted to be like Snoop. They all wanted to exert violence just like Snoop. They all wanted to yell at each other and be the boss like Snoop. So I fall into that same category and lose myself as a person because I try to combat these individuals and fight like these individuals to where I became these individuals. To where I started acting arrogant and I started getting trying to become highly influential in the movement. Next thing you know, you got five of us trying to fight over the yard while Stoops over there in Lancaster fighting a murder case. That I forgot the whole true purpose and meaning of this movement. And I honestly, to this day, I idolize Fo for that. Because even though he got whacked and he tried to get it approved through Snoop, you know what Snoop says? Hey, Kern Valley is his own comedian, bro. I can't override that decision, bro. You're gone. After 15 years of dedicating that man's life to Snoop, to this movement, to trying to elevate it, publishing Snoop's book, and they whacked him only because... Of his, of his overpopularity because he wanted to be a boss just like Snoop, just because he kept utilizing Snoop's name, just because he kept telling on the yard to Snoop, and Snoop wasn't getting back out of him because Snoop had his own personal problems, they whacked him. They said, you know, we're just going to get rid of this dude. He's not good to us anyways. He's, always, he's too focused on his book publishing. So a man that wanted to seek success and success for his brothers gets whacked because he was only doing the right thing and following Snoop's orders. Snoop let him go down for it. So when I landed on the when Fo landed on the yard in Tehachapi, I told the comp all that like, bro, don't don't even try to pick on this dude, bro. Cause this dude's done stuff for this movement for the last 15 years that you guys haven't even even done within a year or two, within this last year or two. All you guys care about is drugs, man. That man's gonna be left alone. And I used to spend a lot of time with Fo. I was, when I wasn't on the table kicking it with the compas and the Playboys, I would spend time with Fo because Fo used to always teach me, like, man, be better. Be better for yourself. Not saying disassociate myself from the moment. He was like, man, just think of, think of all the things that you can accomplish. That man's doing life without the possibility of parole. And that fool's making thousands of dollars a month publishing books. Going up to inmates saying, hey, bro, tell your story. I'll type it up. I'll publish it. I'll give you 40% of the earnings. And he's making money like that. That's the creativity that I'm seeking. That's the creativity and the innovation that I've always wanted for my life. That I want to create something that belongs to me. And being that I have this YouTube channel now, I'm starting to feel just like that man did. Like, man, I got something for myself to look forward to, to create content with, to make money from, but also to become something great. Not just be a gang member no more. Not just walk around with a gang mentality thinking the gang banging mentality is, is it. That's not, the, that's not the level of boss I want to be. I want to be my own boss. I want to have something that belongs to me that I can earn from and not have it being dictated or lose it by somebody else's... Uh, Iron hand, should I say. But that was just a cold story, man. I, I always looked up to Fo because Fo did something creative. And Fo, he helped me out a lot during those years because he helped me. I, I got out of trouble for a year. And so I had a beat up old boy from Compton and then I got transferred to Hatchaby. And from then I just, nine batteries back to back to back because Snoop wanted everybody knocked down. No questions asked. So I kept fulfilling my duties, not realizing that, man, I'm just playing into the part of this man's egotistic maniac, bad governance. That's where I made the fatal mistake. I was just listening to this man. And I'm thankful that I'm in the position that I am today because now I'm home. I'm free. Now I got the opportunity. Now I get to experience my own liberty and freedom, my free will to do as I please. And that's why I'm so thankful and blessed to have this YouTube. So I hope you guys like my story, man. It's a, there's a lot more to it, how he got whacked, how they jumped him. But, I, you know, I can't talk into the, the, the big parts of it. You know, I'm only just giving you a story that I feel was interesting enough to tell you guys. But that man showed me that no matter what predi predicament you're in or what situation you're in, you could be successful at something. Just be creative and put your mind to it and find your resources and apply yourself. 
So with that being said, man, thank you guys for your guys' time. Hit the like, leave a comment, tell me what you think about this story. And like I always say, it's one life, one chance. We only got one chance to do this right. Let's get it done. Peace.